For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. In backcountry camping, you're venturing into the heart of the untamed wilderness. In this activity, you embrace the wild terrain and face whatever challenges it throws at you. The stakes are high and nature's indifference to our presence is a stark reality as the dangers are as real as the allure. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. In the heart of North America unfolds the enchanting terrain of the Chihuahuan Desert. It is a realm of extremes where the harsh beauty of arid landscapes conceals a treasure trove of life, resilience, and ancient stories etched in the very fabric of the earth. Stretching across parts of the United States and Mexico, the Chihuahuan Desert is the largest desert in North America. Here, amidst the golden sands and rugged terrain, a dazzling array of flora and fauna has learned to survive and thrive in one of the most arid environments on the continent. The Chihuahuan Desert covers approximately 140,000 square miles or 360,000 square kilometers. Summers can be extremely hot, often exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius. For centuries, indigenous peoples have called this desert home, leaving a legacy of traditions deeply intertwined with the land. With vast expanses adorned with iconic yucca plants and sagebrush, this desert is truly a spectacle. Nestled within the Chihuahua Desert is Carlsbad Caverns National Park. While it's known for its complex system of more than 119 limestone caves, several hiking trails and backcountry camping areas on the surface provide opportunities for exploration of the desert landscape and panoramic views of the surrounding area. In the Chihuahuan Desert, there is an opportunity for introspection and communion with the essence of the wild. Its beauty and untamed wilderness are like no other, giving those brave enough to venture onto its terrain a reverence for its sacred lands. For Dave Coughlin and Rafi Kodikian, their journey into the Chihuahuan Desert would be a catastrophe. In August 1999, Dave Coughlin was embarking on a cross-country move to attend graduate school, and his best friend Rafi Kodikian decided to come along. While Kodikian waited in Boston, Dave handled the final details in Norfolk County, Massachusetts. That morning, he bid farewell to his girlfriend Sonnet in Milford, arriving in Boston around 4 o'clock. Rafi eagerly joined him, and they began their journey. The road trip marked the culmination of weeks of planning. Dave brought along a travel diary to capture important moments on the trip. Over nearly five years, their friendship endured separations, graduations, career challenges, and the trials of relationships. His relationship with Day Deku originated in 1991 when Dave was a freshman at UMass Amherst. Deku's friend, Kirsten Swan, attended Boston University and dated Rafi. Dave and Rafi took on to each other quite quickly. They had similar interests and they continued their friendship despite him and Day breaking up. After college, Rafi tried to join the Boston Globe as a writer, but after some setbacks, ended up going into the financial sector. At the same time, Dave navigated various jobs while living with his parents. Dave envisioned an opportunity in California for graduate school at UC Santa Barbara. However, to qualify, he needed to establish residency, requiring a year in the state before classes began. Money was a factor, and though his parents could offer some assistance, he'd need to work and save. Consulting with his dad, they decided he should visit California. Dave flew out on May 18, 1999, accompanied by Kirsten, who had relatives in the area, and was considering moving out there as well. At this time, Rafi and Kirsten had broken up. Despite her past relationship with Rafi, Swan and Dave had grown closer. Rafi approved, considering the amicable breakup. Initially, Rafi couldn't join Dave on his adventure. Dave's southern swing route mirrored a trip Rafi took in 1997, Rafi was a writer and sold the road trip story to the Boston Globe. A week before Dave's departure, Rafi, Kirsten, Sonnet, and friends hosted a bittersweet going-away dinner, realizing they wouldn't see Dave for a long time. Excitedly discussing his plans to visit Graceland, New Orleans, and Austin, Dave's enthusiasm stirred Rafi's wanderlust. Rafi immediately requested unpaid leave from work, which was granted, convincing his supervisor to give him the time off. Dave delayed the road trip by two weeks to accommodate Rafi's inclusion. Starting their journey south, they visited Rafi's parents and Dave's sister. Arriving in New Orleans, they explored Bourbon Street before heading to Austin, 
craving a real bed and booking a Motel 6. Eager for a break, they discuss their itinerary over beers at a local bar. Despite being a day ahead of schedule, the pace was taking a toll, and the trip felt lacking to what they had seen in five cities, and they wanted something more rugged. They were planning to head northwest to Amarillo and then west to Santa Fe, so they aimed for the Grand Canyon on Thursday. Dave, recalling advice to visit Carlsbad Caverns, realized it was on their route west, proposing a detour through Phoenix on Thursday. Around 5 p.m., road-weary and nursing hangovers, they reached White City near Carlsbad Caverns National Park. Seeking a camping spot, they inquired at the visitor center. The ranger suggested Rattlesnake Canyon, five miles down a dirt road. Having camped only once so far, the friends considered their limited opportunities to rough it. They decided to go for it, obtaining a camping permit from the ranger. Rafi noted their car details and both names on the permit. Afterward, he bought three pint-sized water bottles, far below the gallon each the ranger suggested. Rafi and David anticipated having Rattlesnake Canyon to themselves, as no other cars were in the small dirt lot. They considered themselves well-equipped with camping gear, possessing essentials like pocket knives, hats, sunglasses, boots, flashlights, matches, band-aids, and cigarette lighters. However, they lacked key items such as a compass, signal mirror, binoculars, whistle, and a first aid kit. Standard camping equipment included a tent, sleeping bags, foam pads, a portable stove, fuel, frying pans, dishes, and Tupperware. Their food supplies included creamed corn, beans, hot dogs, buns, and energy bars. Among trivial items were playing cards and cigars. With packs on their shoulders, they descended the trail into the canyon, passing rock cairns marking the way. After reaching the canyon floor, they rested, consuming water to combat the mid-80s temperature. Despite the flat terrain offering camping options, they pressed on, choosing a site next to a rock face with a natural bench. After setting up the tent, they prepared dinner, hot dogs and creamed corn, realizing they needed water to boil the hot dogs. Their last pint of water was used, and after the meal, they quenched their thirst with Gatorade. As dusk settled in, the two friends reflected on their 2,700-mile journey through America, feeling accomplished. They planned to visit the cave the next day and later head to the Grand Canyon. Chatting about the future of their friendship, they slept in their tent under the soft desert night. The duo packed their gear as morning arrived and prepared to resume their journey. After hiking slightly over a mile, they encountered a cairn on the riverbed's edge accompanied by a path leading to the canyon's eastern slopes where they had descended the previous evening. Pausing to rest, they realized the easy downhill they experienced would now be an uphill climb. They checked their water bottles, finding little left from the previous night's hike and hot dog preparation. However, a full Gatorade bottle awaited them back at the car. They drank the remaining water to fortify themselves for the ascent. Continuing, they followed the trail into a brush field, surprised when it led them back into the riverbed. After about 50 yards, they felt a sense of unfamiliarity. Believing the exit trail was farther back, they backtracked through the field, meticulously searching for cairns marking the trail. Unable to find any, they concluded that the exit was likely a few hundred yards back. Backtracking confidently, they noticed reassuring cairns in a wide spot where a small side canyon joined Rattlesnake's main channel. Expecting to see more cairns in the direction of their car, they were mystified when none appeared. Consulting the topographical map Rafi had purchased, they hoped its $7.95 cost would prove worthwhile. The map, created in collaboration with the Park Service, detailed the caverns and the park's backcountry, including trails, roads, springs, and riverbeds. Both had trouble deciphering the map. Despite this, they remained undiscouraged and formed a search area of about a quarter mile along the riverbed and canyon slopes. Initially walking quickly, then trying shorter intervals with stops, occasionally splitting up, they explored different areas. Each location seemed to hold the key, and when the path failed to appear, they found humor in the situation, joking about the campsite being half-assed. However, they grew quieter as the morning progressed into the afternoon, sensing a change in Rattlesnake Canyon. By 11 a.m., with the sun above the canyon walls and temperatures climbing at about 3 degrees per hour, they retreated into the shade of a shrub bank. 
Initially planning to resume their search in a few minutes, they lingered in the relative coolness of the bushes, contemplating the incredibility that they had been carefree in the canyon only three hours earlier. Around noon, a cloud cover provided relief from the sun, and more importantly signaled the onset of the rainy season. Rafi and David emerged from beneath the bush as raindrops fell, letting the downpour cool their skin. Feeling the first pangs of thirst, they regretted not having containers to collect water. However, they observed water pooling beneath larger rocks and swiftly improvised. Kneeling over the puddles, they slurped mouthfuls of gritty water, spitting it back into empty bottles. By the end of the rain, they had collected about three quarters of a pint each, adopting a strategy of rationing small sips. Buoyed by the rain, they resumed the search for the exit trail, uncertain of their location in the canyon. Opting to avoid getting further lost, they decided to stay in the general area, hoping rangers would search for them soon. Hunger set in, and they turned to prickly pear cactus for sustenance, discovering the succulent and sweet fruit on the pads. As weariness set in during the late afternoon, they accepted that they wouldn't find the trail that day. Facing their second night in Rattlesnake Canyon, they found little solace in the desert dusk, but took comfort in the cooler temperatures. Chewing on cactus fruit, they discussed their situation, acknowledging they were lost in a desert with limited water. However, the camping permit became a symbol of hope, a tangible piece of evidence of their presence, akin to a contract entitling them to rescue. Despite concerns about the ranger misplacing it, they tried to stay optimistic, bolstered by the rain and the cactus fruit discovery. That night, they spotted car headlights on a distant canyon wall, convincing them that heading in that direction would lead to a road. The next morning on Friday, August 6th, the day they were meant to be in California, they hiked in that direction. During their journey, they encountered the remnants of a ranch foundation. Besides the cairns marking the canyon trail, this foundation was the sole hint of civilization in the area. As Kodikian dubbed it, Mountain Number 3 loomed about 700 feet west of the foundation. Although it resembled a mountain from below, it was part of Rattlesnake Canyon's southwestern wall, featuring inhospitable terrain with ridges and gullies. The ridges resembling gnarled fingers led to the summit but were serrated by impassable limestone formations. Alternatively, the gullies, though smoother, were steeper and littered with rubble. Dagger-like agave plants further complicated the ascent. Wading through creosote bushes at the base, they began climbing, navigating around cacti and taking breaks to indulge in cactus fruit. The ascent was slow, with the constant threat of slipping down the steep slopes. As they reached the upper sections, towering limestone walls blocked their path, forcing them to traverse left for a more gradual route. Every challenging ledge they conquered revealed another ahead, seemingly endless. Despite their exhaustion, they persisted until they reached the summit unexpectedly, anticipating a road but finding none. The lights they saw the night before led them astray, offering minimal assistance at great cost. Now farther from their car, they were exposed to barren heights with little shade, depleting more water than the entire previous day. What are we doing up here? We should have stayed in camp. This is stupid, Dave expressed. Let's move a little farther on, Rafi suggested. The climb out had at least freed them from Rattlesnake Canyon, placing them on a nearly flat plateau. Despite their elevated vantage point, they failed to spot recognizable landmarks like the visitor center or water tanks. Continuing across the plateau, Kodikian's strength waned, prompting him to rest in the shade of a shrub while Coughlin surveyed. To the south, a new landscape unfolded, revealing desert plains below. If we can make it out onto those plains, there's gotta be a road out there, Dave reported excitedly. Rafi listened but made no move to get up. Exhaustion had immobilized him. If you think you can make it, go, Kodikian told him. Send back help, he said. Coughlin hesitated, unwilling to leave his friend, and eventually joined him in the shade. As the temperature soared into the 90s, they abandoned thoughts of venturing onto the plains, hoping for cooler conditions later. They spent the entire day Friday on the plateau, seeking whatever shade they could find. Ants bit them as they lay on the ground, prompting them to move to a larger bush, where they hung their shirts for additional shade. Despite their efforts, the temperature reached nearly 100 degrees by 3 p.m. 
At this point, vultures started circling the duo. To them, this signaled they were waiting for them to die and feast on their flesh. They knew they were stranded in the desert, and now the vultures were circling. There's no way we're gonna let that happen to us. We'll kill ourselves first. We will not let the buzzards get us alive. God forgive us, Rafi later wrote in the journal. The environment seemed to assail them even when lying still. The ants, sharp rocks, birds, burrs in their socks, and the wind that constantly blew their shirts off the branches, forcing them to rise and reposition. In the late afternoon, Dave finally turned to Rafi. I gotta get out of here or I'm gonna go nuts, he said. Rafi had also had enough of the plateau and so after expending invaluable amounts of water climbing out of Rattlesnake Canyon, they rose from the languishment of the bush, wearily put their shirts back on, and prepared to walk back into the trap they had toiled to escape. Before leaving the plateau, they sucked on more cactus fruit, but given the heat, still near 100 by 5 p.m., it didn't help much. Sweat covered them as they descended into the canyon, again struggling for footholds on the upper slopes. They were thirsty beyond desperation when they were halfway back to the ranch foundation. They decided it was time to employ the oldest trick in the book. They would drink their own urine. What they didn't know was the urine of a dehydrated person is especially toxic and concentrated, and drinking it forces the kidneys to draw water from the blood to dilute it. In other words, urine takes more water to digest than it actually supplies. Kodikian took off his baseball cap. They brought the empty water bottles, hoping it might rain again. He turned the cap over, positioned it over one of the bottles, and peed. His urine was dark and concentrated. He put the bottle to his lips and sipped. The acrid taste of ammonia overwhelmed him. He tried to swallow, but immediately began to gag. There's no way we're gonna be able to drink this, Rafi said. Dave saw the look on his face and took his word for it. They continued toward the canyon floor. As they got closer, Coughlin caught a glimpse of something they could drink, sitting on the walls of the ranch foundation. They saw several plastic bottles, exactly the kind they bought at the visitor center waiting right there on the ruined wall. They both realized the rangers must have come and seen the note they'd left back at the campsite. We're heading towards the ranch foundation, it had said. They must have left the bottles in case Rafi and David came back. Their relief was instant. For two days, they'd been fantasizing about clean, cold water. Dave had been getting weak in the legs, having difficulty bracing himself against the downhill slope so he told Rafi to go on ahead for the water, he'd catch up. Kodikian was drained, but worked his way through the scratchy maze of brush near the bottom without stopping. When he finally emerged into the open space of the riverbed, he made a beeline straight for the foundation. The water was not there. He sat down on the wall and waited for Dave. He could hear him snapping through the brush, knocking rocks around. He didn't have the heart to yell to him that it was yet another false lead. When Dave finally staggered over and saw that there was no water, he barely had the energy to dam the mirage. His legs were seizing up on him and he immediately collapsed against the old stone wall. I feel dizzy, he said. They sat a while on the foundation's ledge, waiting for Dave to catch his breath. There was no question where they'd go now. Back to camp was their only option until they got some rest. Dave rose to his legs which shook and could barely walk. Rafi gave him his shoulder to lean on and they made the trek back. But Rafi knew this was a bad turn of events. If Dave couldn't walk out, the situation would worsen. But to their surprise, they spotted a cairn they hadn't seen before. This gave them new hope, and they decided they needed to rest and prepare for the trek tomorrow. If Dave couldn't make it, Rafi would go alone. When they rose on Saturday morning, Coughlin felt an improvement in his condition. Outside the tent, he stood up, stretched his legs tentatively and informed Rafi that he still had enough strength for another attempt. He didn't want to face the prospect of being left alone, and Rafi was relieved he wouldn't have to confront the hike back to the car alone. This time, they opted not to carry anything with them. The effort of carrying their own bodies out of the canyon would be challenging enough. Locating the cairn they'd seen on Friday proved to be a challenge. They initially walked past it and had to double back before Coughlin finally spotted it again. Standing beside the marker, they took a deep breath and focused on the task. The key to success lay in spotting another cairn they hadn't seen before, maybe one or two more. 
Once on the trail, it would be easier to follow, angled upward instead of concealed in the brush and stone-strewn flats of the canyon floor. However, their trek yielded no success. The duo remained lost, struggling to make sense of the terrain. I'm going back to camp, Coughlin groaned, turning toward the one certainty he could find. I'm going to keep looking for a little while, Rafi told Dave. He sensed the surrender in his friend's voice, and the growing sense of futility was affecting him too. Climbing a small rise to the right of the cairn, he gazed across the canyon toward the opposite slope. They had suspected the trail was in that direction, but amidst the uniform mix of rock, dirt, and cacti, he realized he could be staring directly at the trail and not even see it. He heard Dave calling for him. Returning to the campsite, Kadikian found Coughlin struggling to arrange larger nearby stones into a pattern. Beneath their weight, Coughlin weaved drunkenly, dropping them down angrily and nudging them into position with his feet. He was attempting to spell SOS. Let me do that, you can work on a signal fire, Rafi suggested. While Rafi finished with the stones, Dave collected anything nearby that would burn and threw it into a pile. They poured what was left of their cooking fuel over it, ignited it, and as the smoke drifted away, they were not impressed. It barely even rose, just lingered in a sticky haze on the canyon floor. Growing desperate, they threw in Rafi's sleeping bag, hoping it would generate better smoke. It seemed promising momentarily as white bilious plumes spewed from the fire, but it still wouldn't rise above the walls. The one thing they didn't burn was the journal. Sometime later that day, Coughlin made his first entry, addressing his girlfriend, Sonnet Frost. Nobody is coming to help. I love you. Tell Dan if I find a heavenly monkey, I will forward one along. We had forever, but now all we have is eternity. Who knows, maybe I'll get kicked out for disorderly conduct and be able to pay you a visit. You will always be in my heart, and you will always have an angel standing by. Eternally yours, David Andrew. P.S. I'm trying so hard to be strong right now, it's not working. Following their desperate signals for help, they sought refuge in the tent on what turned out to be the hottest day yet. By midday, the canyon's temperature was nearly 110 degrees. Battling the scorching heat, they cut the bottom out of their tent to allow air circulation upward and to access the cooler stones below, finding relief from the tent's nylon lining. Throughout the day, they continually shifted the rocks, replacing them as soon as they warmed, also grabbing handfuls of pebbles and running them down their backs imagining the sensation of water. Clouds eventually began to roll in during the late afternoon. Crawling out of the tent, they took turns writing in the journal. Dave bid farewells to his family, friends, and Rafi. As the situation grew more dire, Rafi wrote for Coughlin, who was too weak to write. He documented, Dave has asked that his remains be cremated and thrown over the edge of the Grand Canyon. I leave the handling of my remains to my family. In serious pain, according to Kadikian, they decided to end their lives together. Rafi pulled out his Gerber folding knife, and as it gleamed in the light of the ineffectual signal fire, both he and Dave attempted to slice into their veins, but exhaustion or fear prevented a fatal cut. According to Kadikian, as the night wore on, Coughlin's pain and determination to die increased. Sometime near dawn, he made a request that Rafi would honor. Dave asked him to kill him. He couldn't take the pain anymore. He lifted his arm and asked his best friend to stab him in the heart. Rafi took the knife and made a stab but had a hard time getting deep, but Coughlin was in pain from the stab. Come on, just do it, Dave said, egging him on. This time Rafi penetrated deep. Dave yells, so Rafi covers his mouth as he continues to dig into his friend's body. Soon after, the yelling stopped and Dave Coughlin was lifeless. He wrote in the journal, I killed and buried my best friend today. Dave had been in pain all night. At around five or six, he turned to me and begged that I put my knife through his chest. I did. And a second time when he wouldn't die, he still breathed and spoke, so I told him I was going to cover his face. He said, okay, he struggled but died. I buried him with love. God and his family and mine, please forgive me. After Coughlin stopped moving, silence ensued briefly broken while Rafi laid stones on Coughlin's grave, then enveloping him again from every direction for another seven hours until the footsteps of Ranger Lance Matson finally shattered it. 
Around 1.30 p.m. on August 8, 1999, Park Ranger Lance Matson surveyed a maroon Mazda with Massachusetts plates, examining the expansive canyon below. The camping permit, issued to two men for a one-night stay four days earlier, signaled their overdue status. After seeking approval from a park volunteer, Matson set off towards the Rattlesnake Canyon Trail. Navigating the mountainside, he reached a ridge overlooking the campsite despite the absence of campers. Descending 670 feet, he encountered Rafi Kodikian. Please tell me you have water, Rafi Kodikian gasped. Filthy and unkempt, clad only in shorts, he displayed scrapes on his arms and legs, typical of navigating through backcountry brush. The ranger swiftly handed him a bottle. Where's your buddy? He inquired. Over there, Rafi responded, pointing towards the canyons. However, Matson saw no one. Where? Right there. Kodikian insisted, pointing to the mound of rocks a few feet away. I killed him. When Mattinson initially arrived, the situation seemed dire, with only three empty water bottles, merely three quarts between the two men. Heavy rocks had been arranged in the SOS pattern, although the last S was incomplete. Some of their belongings, a blue sleeping pad, a t-shirt, a sock, bore blood smudges, as did some rocks. However, despite dehydration, Kodikian could speak coherently, and recovered within an hour of receiving a saline IV. Coughlin's autopsy revealed moderate to severe dehydration, but his urine and blood levels weren't deficient enough to cause death, indicating he was alive when stabbed. Investigators questioned how they got lost, given their campsite's proximity to the trailhead and their car. They also wondered how, if Kodikian was weak, he managed to bury his friend under 50-pound rocks. Another mystery was burning one of the men's sleeping bags believed to be Coughlin's. Despite this, provisions like an unopened family-sized can of beans, a hot dog bun, and a first aid kit were found. Ranger Mark Makiha, arriving after Matson, struggled to rationalize their actions. Desert survival experts cautioned against imposing logic on such situations. Rafi was subsequently airlifted to the hospital, where a local investigator eagerly awaited questioning. When dehydration sets in, people make irrational decisions, notes desert survivalist David Alloway. I've seen people do some foolish things. Authorities discovered the journal of Dave and Rafi, containing 16 entries chronicling desperation and despair in the desert. Both men expressed diminishing stamina and bid farewell to loved ones. Kodikian took Coughlin's life in Carlsbad Caverns National Park, stabbing him twice with a four-inch folding knife he confessed to a park ranger and in the journal found at the scene. Now, a full-scale investigation would commence. The question lingered. Was it a mercy killing, an act of devotion between best friends, or something else? The answer would decide Kodikian's fate. His attorney, Gary Mitchell, portrayed it as a fatal act of kindness, part of a death pact. He claimed Kodikian intended suicide after ending Coughlin's suffering but was too weak. New Mexico law doesn't permit mercy killings, but the sheriff and prosecutor contested Kodikian's account. Despite moderate to severe dehydration, Kodikian was coherent when found walking with normal vital signs. Both officials questioned the logic of Kodikian's actions, doubting the narrative of imminent death. The sheriff pointed to Kodikian's strength in moving heavy rocks, stating, it's not logical. Law enforcement rejected Kodikian's justification emphasizing that killing someone isn't permissible in New Mexico simply because they request it. Consequently, Rafi Kodakin was charged with second-degree murder. One motive proposed that Coughlin admitted to a previous involvement with Kodikian's ex-girlfriend, Kirsten Swan, potentially triggering jealousy and anger in Kodikian. Sheriff Click dispatched a senior deputy to Boston in search of a hidden motive but found no evidence of discord. Even if Coughlin's death was seen as a mercy killing, it remained a homicide. Kodikian acknowledged guilt, and he faced a second-degree murder charge for David Coughlin's death. The case garnered extensive media coverage, fueling debates on morality, survival instincts, and the legal ramifications of extreme situations. Kodikian's trial became a focal point for discussions regarding the boundaries of compassion and the intricate decision-making involved in life-threatening circumstances. Mitchell signaled his intent to pursue an insanity defense, contending that extreme heat and thirst had mentally disoriented Kodikian during the fatal act. The judge, however, 
dismissed the insanity defense requiring prolonged insanity for such claims in New Mexico. An involuntary intoxication defense was also attempted but deemed complex for court proceedings. Mitchell briefed Rafi on the option to plead guilty to second-degree murder, allowing him to preserve the right to appeal the judge's decision on the involuntary intoxication motion. Opting for the plea deal meant proceeding directly to a sentencing hearing, which, in this unique case the judge anticipated, would involve extensive testimony and argument beyond the norm. Rather than relying on a New Mexico jury, Kadikian accepted the plea deal, admitting guilt to second-degree murder and entrusting his fate to the court. Despite apparent support from David Coughlin's family for Rafi's assertions, he still had to confront the consequences of his friend's murder. During Kadikian's sentencing hearing, it was revealed that Coughlin's vomiting was likely a reaction to unripe cactus fruit, not the terminal stage of death by thirst. While both were dehydrated, other individuals had endured longer periods in hotter conditions and survived. Sitting tight and waiting for help would likely have sufficed. In an emotionally charged testimony during the hearing, Kadikian described how his friend, David Coughlin, pleaded for relief after four days of suffering from dehydration in Carlsbad Caverns National Park. Kadikian's defense centered on an entry in the journal where he referred to buzzards, illustrating their limited wilderness experience and perception shaped by Hollywood portrayals. What I thought I was doing was keeping my friend from going through 12 to 24 hours of hell before he died, Kadikian told the court. When the lawyers were through presenting their case, he announced his sentence. I find that it's unlikely that Mr. Kadikian will find himself in the situation that we've heard about for the past two days. The improbability of a reoccurrence turns the court's thoughts along a path of a consideration more of a general deterrence. A long period of incarceration what the state has asked for, a severe sentence. But long incarceration I think has been proved here to not be the solution. I believe that it's predictable that Rafi does not pose a threat or danger to society. I do, however, think that Rafi Kadikian deserves to be punished for his violation of the law and the taking of the life of his friend, David Coughlin. Retribution, in this court's mind, serves the very important and crucial purpose of preserving the rule of law that we all have to have for an orderly society. Rafi Kadikian's conduct in this situation caused the life of David Coughlin to end. Mr. Coughlin was a particularly vulnerable victim and the impact on his family is never and will never be forgotten by them. I do know that Rafi's conduct was not a result of a sustained criminal intent. His character and attributes that I have heard and read about suggest that he's not likely to reoffend. It is the court's sentence that Rafi be sentenced to 15 years in the Corrections Department of the State of New Mexico, and the execution of that sentence be suspended with the exception of 24 months. Rafi Kodikian accepted his two-year sentence as he raised his hands to his face to hide his tears. A few minutes later, Kadikian, Mitchell, and Boyne walked upstairs to the courthouse's third floor, where they held a short press conference. I still feel I did the right thing, Rafi told the reporters. I feel that anybody in my position who would turn their back on their friend in that position wouldn't be deserving of coming out of that canyon in the first place. How do you feel about the sentence? One reporter asked. This is a life sentence, he said. I will spend the rest of my life trying to justify my actions. Nearly a year following Kadikian's sentencing, Emily Shulman found herself lost in Rattlesnake Canyon. A hiker discovered an envelope on the canyon floor containing a letter from Emily penned two days earlier expressing her predicament and the need for help. Alongside her farewell messages to friends and family, the Boston, Massachusetts return address fueled the hiker's initial skepticism, reminiscent of the coughlin kadikian case. However, as he encountered torn-up bits of paper and fragments of business cards with more pleas for assistance from Shulman, his skepticism turned to genuine concern. He swiftly returned to the visitor center and mobilized teams of rangers and law enforcement officers to navigate Rattlesnake Canyon. The search took them past the location where Kadikian was found lying next to his friend's body. Despite hours of searching, a search plane eventually spotted Shulman around 3 p.m waving a t-shirt about a mile west of the exit trail. Her rescue came just in time as she was nearly out of water. Shulman explained that she had ventured into the canyon for a day hike, missing the exit trail. This incident appeared to validate the family's belief that better marked trails and prompt recognition of overdue hikers could have prevented the tragedy involving David and Rafi. 
Post-sentencing, the Coughlins even established a fund to equip the park with GPS systems for backcountry hikers to check out at the visitor center. As per prison authorities, Kadikian demonstrated exemplary behavior during his incarceration. His positive conduct resulted in a reduced sentence to 16 months. Released in November 2001, Kadikian made it home in time for Thanksgiving. Regrettably, David Coughlin would never return home. However, a portion of him found its way to what could have been his next destination on the journey to California. Rafi's journal entry expressing Dave's desire for cremation and scattering over the Grand Canyon's edge became a poignant reality. In August 2001, two years after his passing in Rattlesnake Canyon, the Coughlin family traveled to Arizona, honoring Dave's wish by dispersing his ashes into the majestic depths of the Grand Canyon. Stranded in the vast expanse of the unknown, you find yourself facing challenges that push the limits of your endurance. When the path ahead seems shrouded in uncertainty and the wilderness whispers its challenges, every obstacle you overcome is a testament to your strength and tenacity. In the wilderness where survival becomes a raw and primal instinct, every setback is an opportunity to learn, adapt, and grow. Embrace the obstacles, for within it lies the chance to discover the depths of your own capabilities. Never forget the power of hope. It is the spark that ignites the fire within, casting a warm glow even in the darkest corners of the wilderness. In moments of doubt, remember you are not a victim, you are a survivor. Let the challenges become the stepping stones to your own triumph. Never give up, for the wilderness may test your body, but your spirit is unbreakable. The journey may be arduous, but with unwavering determination, you will emerge from the wild stronger, wiser, and forever changed by the wilderness. Embrace the discomfort as a relentless instructor. Your principles may be tested, your comfort zones will be shattered. Adaptability is your greatest ally. Each agonizing step through the rugged terrain is a declaration of your will to survive. Pain is the price of admission to the wild. Embrace it, let it fuel your determination and wear your scars as badges of resilience. The wilderness doesn't tolerate excuses, it demands results. Take responsibility for your survival. The wilderness is indifferent to your plight. Face the harsh realities head on, adapt, overcome, and emerge not as a victim, but as a relentless survivor who stared into the abyss and refused to be consumed. Remember, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher, but like any instruction, if you respect and learn from your instruction, the wilderness will be an ally. Heed these words so you can overcome an outdoor disaster. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.